Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Arigato. <laughs> um, uh, on the airplane from Sapporo yesterday, I caught a cold. So please forgive me um, if I have to take a moment and clear my nasal passage. Uh, my name is Alex Collier, and I am from the United States of America. And ever since I was eight years old, I have been having contact with a group of human beings from the constellation of Andromeda, which is in our own galaxy. We are going to talk um, for a couple of hours about a, about a great deal of things. Um, first, I would like to share with you, and I want to be sure to go slow so that the translators <laughs> um, are able to repeat everything. Earth, our home, is one of a kind. There is no other place like it. Nowhere else in all of our galaxy do we have as much insect life, plant life, mammal, animal, reptilian, human, many, many different races, many different types of life forms in a very, very complex ecosystem. <clears throat> the story on how Earth became so complex is that because we are at the edge of our galaxy, many extraterrestrial explorers, ET explorers, would pass by some would stay, some would uh, take water before their journey out of our galaxy to another. Many would leave life forms that they had found or discovered elsewhere on Earth. <clears throat> Many of these life forms would have to be genetically modified so that they could live here. This is why in much of the geological record we find life forms fully formed. The Andromedans are a human race. There are human races everywhere throughout our galaxy and other galaxies. There are many other different types of life forms as well. All having consciousness on different levels of dimensions, different dimensions not only on third density, but fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, etc. Within those densities, dimensions, there is physicality. Okay? Um, different physicality, but there is a physicality. The Andromedan race is very ancient. Its ancestry can be traced in our galaxy to Lyra. The reason for the pigmentations of their skin, which is blue, is because of the minerals in their soil and their sun. They come from fifth dimension. They are not third dimension like we are. 
As such, they have a different perspective, different technology, different spirituality, and yet they want to share with us the knowledge of who we are. Now, like all people on earth, ETs also have a different perspective. They view events differently. <clears throat> Therefore, like with all things that are an experience, of which we gain wisdom, we have to use discernment. Okay? The Andromedans are one of at least 22 different races that they claim have genetic lineage to us on Earth. They claim to be one of our ancestors, dating back as far as and before of Lemuria, 62,000 years ago. Now, because they are fifth density, does not mean that they can physically be in third. They can be. Many using technology even for short times, periods of time. <sighs> the reason they have come back is that our technology on Earth, much of which we're not even aware of, because as Dr. Sala has said, has been classified or is secret, particularly that of, um, for war, for defense, has far surpassed our spirituality. The reason they're concerned based on past galactic history everywhere is that when technology far surpasses spirituality, that particular race in most cases destroys itself. This, of course, would grieve them. And throughout our galaxy, there are the remnants of civilizations that have reached a high level of technology that no longer exist. The reason this is a concern is because the currency of the galaxy is not money. It's consciousness and it's DNA. It is life forms. It is the expression of life. It is the expression of life becoming something else and evolving. It is the expression of a, of a, a life form reaching consciousness becoming aware of itself and evolving to another dimension. These are miracles that we do for ourselves. So this is one of the reasons why many ETs come here to study us, to visit us. Now, having said that, 
I also want you to know that we have free will. There have been many interventions on earth stopping catastrophes and terrible weapons of war. I th it's important that I say this to you. There are no guarantees that they will continue to intervene on our behalf. It is not that we're not worthy. It is not that we're not loved. It's because we have free will. And we, as a race, not just Japan, not just America, not just China, not just Russia, all countries are one race. They see one race. They don't see many races, they see one, the Terran race. And we are creating this reality. Those of us who are awake, those of you here who are discovering yourself or know yourself already and are trying to help awaken others, <clears throat> as we are trying to do in America, which desperately needs that kind of awakening, all share the same passion, and that's peace and love. We all want our children to grow up with clean food, clean water, educations, and free from harm. Again, the reason for saying this, and we will, I will share with you in the Andromedans' own words, um, their concerns for humanity, is because if we stop and make the mistake of thinking someone is going to come and fix our problems, we may have a rude awakening. And then all that time when we could have been working, we did nothing. Okay? The Andromedans are an incredible race. Technologically, they are 10,000 years more advanced than we are if you can compare the two. Spiritually, they consider themselves to be 50,000 years more advanced than we are. This apparently is indicative of the older, more successful civilizations. Spirituality drives technology not the other way around. Okay? The Andromedan legends are that they come, that their ancestors came from Lyra, the constellation of Lyra. However, the human race, those ancestors came from someplace else. They themselves have not discovered the exact root or place of the human race. Legends have it in their world that something cataclysmic was happening in a galaxy where they were and they were told and guided by a force, by um, another race, a higher dimensional race to go enter a wormhole and they would come out in a place that was safe to colonize 
far enough away from the catastrophe, which is our galaxy. These legends are millions and millions and millions and millions of years old. When they discovered space travel, they built small ships. When it was time to migrate to other worlds, they did not have the raw materials to build big 100-mile ships. So the smaller ships would go out into space and would capture asteroids in space. They would pull them into an orbit around their planets. They would hollow them out from the inside and build their spacecraft on the inside of the asteroid. That became their ship. And they would put propulsion systems on the outside and then they would go out into space. They would grow their own food on the inside. They would look for water. Many of their ships, many of the crews of some of those maiden early ships perished because they could not find habitable environments or enough resources. But others did in fact survive. We face those same challenges here on Earth. So there is much that they can teach us. As they evolved as a species, as a race, spiritually, they now travel in 800-mile motherships that are completely self-contained. They use free energy, as Dr. Sala has referred to. In fact, all of them do. Okay. Okay. And the motherships are like their home world. Many of the Andromedans that live on the ships both live, die, reincarnate into other lives on the same motherships. Many have never been to their home world. Their motherships are fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, they pull water from space because everywhere there's hydrogen. Um, they use free energy. On the inside, there are hundreds and hundreds of miles of parks with lakes, forests, groves where they grow food. They are fruitarians. They eat fruit. When their scout teams or scientists uh, go to other parts and they leave the mothership, they take small little green wafers with them. This is their food. That's very nutritious and makes them full. One tablet a day. The Andromedans live an average life of 2,007 years of our Earth years in one life. Some actually live twice that. Okay? So they see many things. They have tremendous wisdom. And as um, the, uh, Colonel Stevens had said in previous lectures, and maybe he said it today, for some reason when the ETs leave their physicality and incarnate back in, come back in through the birth process, they remember who they are. They don't have the spiritual blind that we on earth have to deal with. Their DNA is nine strand, not just two. They are telepathic. If if I could take all of you into their mothership and we were to walk into one of their park areas, you would see many people. But you wouldn't hear a sound except for the birds, the insects, and the animals. Okay, there'd be no sound because they all talk to each other 
by thought transference using telepathy. Um, telepathy <clears throat> is very interesting and it is a phenomenal experience. And as Miss Angelica Wycliffe is going to share with you tomorrow in her talk about telepathy, <clears throat> is that you get entire concepts like this. For example, if we were to take our world and compile books on love, it would probably fill this room and then some. In the Andromedan world, where they come from, when they talk to each other and they talk about love, you get all of those books and more just like that. It's all in your head. It's right there. And now you know everything. It's very hard to process it. Sometimes you don't even know what you have in your head, which is why I'm a big fan of questions and answers periods. Because sometimes if people don't ask the question, I don't necessarily know what I know, okay? The Andromedans <clears throat> use color, light, and holographic tools for healing. Now, it's not that they catch a disease, but occasionally some of their scientists that are out in the world or they're exploring a comet or exploring a quasar, accidents happen, all right? And in that case, they would have to fix their physicality. One of the things that they do is they have this camera that is the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. This camera takes a picture of you. They remove the film. The film has your picture of from the moment you were conceived to the present moment that they take your picture. It has your entire life right there. Now let's say that you are suffering from um, a cancer. What they'll do is they would take a portion of that slide, that picture of you, where your body was the strongest. They will take that out. They will remove the rest of the film. They will take that picture that piece of this picture of you where your body is the strongest, the most vibrant. It doesn't matter the age. And they will put it back into the camera and project that holographic image over your body. And within moments, you're healed. It's just that quick. Okay? So there is technology that they could offer and they're just one of many races that want to help, okay? But again, we have free will. <clears throat> we have free will. There has to be a conscious effort to invite this kind of assistance. At the same time, however, <clears throat> and this is one of their biggest concerns, is that they want us also to take some self-responsibility. Now, it doesn't take everyone on the planet to do that. It takes a percentage, okay? And I'm, that percentage is somewhere between seven and 12%, so I'm told, before it creates what is called the 100th monkey syndrome, where it just makes a conscious shift and People don't even have to be on board. They will suddenly just experience a consciousness shift. And I'm told we're getting very, very close to that, to that percentage where it'll be a domino effect. And suddenly people will just begin to make changes. They may not even know why, and it doesn't even matter at this point, as long as they make some changes and shifts and let go of fear and embrace total mutual respect and love and self-responsibility. That's all that matters. <clears throat> They're more or less waiting for that because they don't want to come down here and babysit us. <clears throat> the times that that's happened in the past in our galaxy, it's not worked. <clears throat> they have discovered that in intervening without mutual, a mutual relationship, a mutual agreement without mutual responsibility, 
that intervention disempowers the race on the planet. And nobody wants to make that mistake again. Okay? Now, why Earth? And then we'll get into how it all started for me. Why Earth? It is the Andromedan perspective that all of us on this planet, regardless of our nationality and our country, are genetic royalty. That we are genetic royalty. Now just think about that concept for a moment. Okay? <laughs> we have science telling us that we're a mistake, that we were a pool of chemicals that suddenly just became us. Um, we're also told that we evolved from a, an animal, animalistic type of life form. We're told a lot of different things, okay? We're told a lot of different things. And right now for this presentation, none of that actually matters because what matters is who we are now and where we are now. And here is a very advanced civilization coming back to Earth and saying, we want you to know that virtually everything you've been told about yourself is bunk, is a lie. That you are, in fact, spiritual beings and you are genetic royalty. Okay? If, if you get nothing else out of this presentation, please take that with you, okay? There is nothing unforgiving about you. There is nothing unloving about you. There is nothing totally humbled about you. You are genetic royalty. All you have to do now is embrace that Embrace who you are as a soul and stand up in power and in self-responsibility. Be the leader that you are. Okay? And you're all leaders. And this is one of the huge differences between what's happening on our world and what's happening in extraterrestrial worlds, ET civilizations, excuse me, is that every single one of their people is raised and trained to be a leader. No followers, mm -mm. no followers, no president, and the people, no. In the Andromedan world, any one of their people, any one of their children could be the president, anyone, because they all have the same knowledge. They practice what is called the law of consistency. Okay, every child, regardless of man or woman, or handicapped, every child learns everything their parents know, everything the scientists know. Nothing is withheld from them in any way, shape, or form. The children go to school, which would be equivalent in, in our world, 150 to 200 years, where they learn all the sciences, they learn to do everything that is required in their uh, culture, in their society. They can choose to do and be anything that they want as long as they contribute. That's technology, that skill, that um, uh, commitment, that intent to the society. They're given everything they need. Nothing is withheld. They would never, ever think to create television to babysit their children would never happen. Everything is geared towards evolution of the soul, spirituality, and the advancement of their race. That's the law of consistency. Okay? They do not dumb down their population, which is something we need to stop doing here on our planet. Okay, the beginning. 1964, I was living in Illinois, um, which is in the center of the United States, and every summer it was 
to go up to the upper northern peninsula of Michigan for a family gathering and picnic. It was like the end of the summer and all the ants and the uggles would fly out and we would all go up there and we would just have a blast for a week and we would stay at my gran grandpa's cabin. Uh, this was in August of 1964, which we did. We went up there and as we were having fun um, on one particular day, um, we decided to go out into the fields and play hide and go seek. And there was a lot of tall grass and there was a lot of trees and chestnut trees and, and apple trees and the such. So there was a lot of insects and bees buzzing about. And the parents were all talking and telling stories about my grandpa and my grandma and, you know, doing the things that they do. So we all went out into the fields to play. Well, I found a, a very good spot to hide and, you know, I moved some apples and some chestnuts and I laid down in the grass and I was hiding, you know, and the grass was, was high. Unless you walked on top of me, you wouldn't see me. <laughs> well, when I woke up, it was close to dusk and this was early afternoon. What had happened to me was that as I had fallen asleep, I woke up and I was on a table. It was in a very uh, lit room, warmly lit room. It wasn't very bright. In fact, this is actually brighter than the room was. And it was very warm temperature wise. And as I'm lying on this table, I'm still fully clothed. There is a man on one side of me, a very short man uh, with very pale skin. He was obviously very old and a very tall man, very young, light blue skin, who was seven foot tall and physically perfect, just like that. <laughs> All I can tell you is that I had absolute instant recognition of who these two men were. There was no fear. I instantly loved them, like I knew them. And I know that you've all had experiences, even in this life, where you've met someone and you know you know them. You just know. There's an instant kinship. And that's because you've known them before in other lifetimes. And on some level, our souls recognize that, even though consciously we, we try to figure something else out. But that's what it is. And that's exactly what it is in this case. Um, the reason that they've come to visit me is that genetically, my lineage of my family goes to them. And the story that they told me was that 60, over 62,000 years ago, I was here and part of an outpost. And I got involved in a skirmish. I tried to break up an argument between two other visiting races and I was killed. My body was terminated, which has put me into the Earth's reincarnational cycle. Now, after I learned that, they, they, um, uh, the smaller man, now they don't have names, they have symbols and tones. But because here on Earth, we are stuck with labeling everything and having to have a label for everything, they have accommodated me by giving me names that they feel in our Earth tongue would somehow be close or would generate to the feeling of their name uh, in Andromeda. The smaller one's name is Phaseus. Um, he was at the time over 4,300 years old when we met for the first time or again. The other is Morinae. And Morinae is 1,700 and something years old in our earth time. Okay, Phaseus has been and is or was considered a great sage in his world because of his years and because of his knowledge and his experience. Okay, I say was because he's crossed over. He's, he's left that body and I, and I don't know if he's reincarnated again into another yet. I'll keep you posted. Um, they, Viseas walked over and got this little cap. Now in the Hebrew world, the Jewish world, in Israel, it would be called a yarmulke, except this was a metallic 
type of a metallic. It almost looked like, like a tin foil, okay? But it had a hole on the top. And it fit very comfortably on my head. Well, the moment they put it on my head, they lifted me up on the table along the wall of the room we were in, monitors uh, of just literally instantaneously appeared off the walls. Now, they weren't there before. Okay, no doors opened, the wall didn't part, they just suddenly appeared. And on these monitors, and there were many of them, were scenes of lifetimes, different scenes of warrior, space, aquatic, earth, Asian, what appeared to be Asian. Um, and I emotionally, as I was viewing each one of these, I emotionally was getting involved. I knew that what I was looking at was me in past lives. Now, I was eight years old. I didn't know any of this. I had been born and raised a Catholic. You know, had the, the snot beat out of us, you know, all that stuff. But I knew, and I can't explain to you how, you, how I knew. It's just that, you know, you know. You know what you know. So I'm looking at these and I'm emotionally involved. And they explained to me that these were some of my past lives on earth. <clears throat> and I've been both the priest, the monk, the warrior, the bad guy, the saint, the holy man. I've been it all. Okay? I've been it all. And so have you. Because earth is more or less a boot camp for the soul. You learn a great deal of experience here so that when you evolve in consciousness, we can take the lessons that we've learned in third density and take them home to our home star systems. Not only that, but you have the genetics as well. And from what I've been told, inside of our racial, inside of our DNA, what science calls junk DNA, there is incredible information and knowledge and wisdom and the ability to develop technologies of a spiritual nature that we have no idea how to even tap into yet because of where we are. Okay? We're all holy people, in a sense, sages, uh, shamans. We all have the knowledge inside. It's just a question of how to tap into it. Is this okay? Okay. Um, so these are some of the things that they were starting to share with me. Now, when this contact was over, and I cannot, it, it had to be several hours, was over. They told me it was time to come back, and I didn't want to come back, um, only because it's not that I didn't miss my mom or, or my brothers and sisters, it was because if you have children, you know they would rather learn than eat. Well, I wanted to learn, okay? I mean, my whole perspective of everything just changed. And uh, when I came back, um, I was on the grass. It was dusk. Um, everybody apparently had been looking for me, and I sat up, and I, I ran back to where the picnic area was, where everybody was. My mother was extremely upset with me um, and said that they had been over there looking for me when I told her what happened. Anyway, I didn't tell her what had happened with, with Moronet and Phaseus because she was still too mad about me not being there, okay? So I thought I'd wait, which I did. I waited until the next morning. And I... I told her as she was working in the kitchen and in the living room, I was kind of following her around saying, you know, Mama, and telling her what had happened. She didn't take it well at all. She didn't take it well at all. Um, and I, I have to regress here ag again for a moment and tell you that before I was brought back to Earth, or sent back to Earth, Both Mornay and Phaseus got down on their knee and they looked me straight in the eye and they said, 
we want you to know that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. It's going to be okay. They made a very special effort to say this to me. Okay? To say this to me. To, to make me aware of, of this. Um, literally, a month later, my mother and one of my baby sisters was killed by a drunk driver in a car accident. And everything changed at that point. Um, just everything had changed. Which led to great shifts in my life. Um, shortly thereafter, I saw them again. And I was very upset about, you know, why didn't you protect her? Why didn't you save her? Why didn't you do something as if, you know, their responsibility? Again, I'm, I'm, nine, I'm nine years old, you know, almost nine at this point. And uh, they were very calm. And they just said, your mother chose the spiritual path. She chose this. We could not intervene. I share that with you. <laughs> Because as much as we want to be victims, we're not victims. We're not. We make choices. You know? And I'm still learning that lesson and living with that lesson as well. Okay? So we're not victims. And, and hopefully that will empower you in some way. Um... Much of what they've shared with me and what I'm extremely grateful for with the Andromedans is they've given me a very interesting reflection of who we are as a race. Um, they're fascinated by us. Most of them are. Back in, in, in um, the 1980s, I was living in um, California. I had a tax practice. I used to be a CPA. Um, in California, Los Angeles, and the contacts started up again. Now, I want to share with you that there has not been any consistent pattern at all. Sometimes I would see them twice in a week, sometimes three times in a week, and then it'd be nothing for months or even years, and then they would just show up again. So there's been no pattern whatsoever. And no, I can't sit there and call them and have them appear like it's a circus. I can't do that. I've tried, sorry. Um, in the 80s, specifically 1987, 1988, 1989, there was a lot of contacts. There was a lot going on. And they've taught me a lot about Earth history. And um, they started asking me questions about our civilization. Now, it doesn't make any sense to me why they would, um, unless they just wanted my perspective and they wanted to know if I knew. Because, you know, they've been studying us for years. They're, they're fifth density, but they're also time travelers. They can go back and forth in time. So they know. They know everything about us. The good, the bad, and the ugly. They know it all. So on one particular occasion, I was asked to talk to them about money. And that discussion regarding money, I'm, I'm going to change the slide here. Um, I spent some time um, putting together a paper on money, the history of money on our planet as far back as I could go, um, and why we use it today, and why it has a measure of value, etc. Now, this went over a period of four to five contacts. When it was over, Mornay was very gracious. He said, thank you very much. I learned a lot. You know, of course, they already knew. But Viseus, and I totally feel like I was set up for this, Viseus just looked at me, and he said, I don't understand. And I'm like, well, what don't you understand? He said, why? Now, he's saying this telepathically because he didn't learn to speak ever. Why? do you have to pay to live on a planet you were born on? I 
Well, that is something our society, our civilization, it's probably a question we would never ask ourselves because we're so used to being ingrained to use money and to allow money to control us. Okay? So that was a question. I bring that up to you only because that question has haunted me ever since that moment till today, and I don't want to be alone with that haunting. So now I've, I've got you there with me, okay? So I'm sharing that with you. If any of you have a, um, an answer to that question, why do we have to pay to live on a planet we were born on, please let me know, okay? And I will push it forward. I don't have a genuine, because none of the other space ET civilizations use money. They don't use it at all. Okay? Um, they just don't use it. <laughs> um, in fact, from that moment on, Viseus would only refer to money as paper with pictures on it. Okay? Which is what it is. Um, our science tells us that there are 100 billion galaxies. They are only looking at one dimension. According to the Andromedans, there are at least 100 trillion galaxies. And every galaxy has a physicality, and it has life in it. So we are so far not alone. It's just amazing, you know. Um, and even NASA um, in the United States mathematically calculated that it would be impossible for us to be alone, okay? So the universe is vast, or the galaxies and the universes are vast. We are, of course, just beginning to travel space. We're going to find ruins everywhere. We're already beginning to find ruins in our own solar system. Uh, Dr. Sala, in his talk, started sharing things with you um, in regards to that. Um, the information is overwhelming, um, absolutely overwhelming, but they have, they're doing everything they can to keep us in this little box. Um, and, you know, that's, that's another topic, all right? So, yes, not only um, is our Earth history, our genetic history being suppressed from us, um, but so is technology. Um, I'm just going to put this out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless me. Um, I have once asked the A's how technologically advanced we were. Um, and the United States military, the secret military, not the people's military, is at least 400 years more advanced than we think they are. Okay. And I apologize for the fact that none of that technology is being shared with any of you. It's not being shared with us either, you know, and we're, we're part of the home country. Um, I want to tell some personal stories, focus on that. Um, I had the privilege in 1989 of spending three months, 92 days to be exact, living with the Andromedans on one of their motherships. In Earth time, from the moment that I, they, that I left and they brought me back, I was only gone 18 minutes. Time travel's a great thing. You'll never be late again for another appointment. That's awesome. Okay. In those three months, I had an opportunity to learn about their society, to observe their society, and um, I was also kind of the guinea pig, the fish in the fish in the in the fish bowl as well, because many of them were able to observe me and listen to my chains of thoughts, um, because they at the time 
we're teaching their children that were on board the craft, they've of course grown into adulthood, many of them, um, about our world. Um, now, their motherships are extraordinary. They're 800 miles. In the middle, on each floor, are, there are park areas. Now, the physical ship on the outside is 800 miles. Okay, that has to deal with the, the outer shell of the craft um, has to pay attention to physical laws in the dimension that it's in. So when they enter third density, and that craft is here in third density, we would see it as 800 miles. Um, even some of their smaller craft, some of their scout craft on the outside when they would show up to take me on board and many of the other ETs that other contactees have met with, let's just say on an average they're 30 feet in diameter on the outside. But on the inside, they deal with different physical, physical laws. And I don't know how they do that. I simply have not been able to grasp it. But the minute you cross that threshold, you literally are in a different dimension or a different plane. Okay? And as such, your physicality has to go through changes. For me, they have to give me a belt that I have to wear that holds my atoms and molecules and cells together. They hold it together for me so that literally it forms like a cocoon around me. Now I can still touch everything, they can touch me, but it holds my cells together so that in fifth density, I'm very comfortable, okay? Physically how it feels, you feel not only lighter, but I felt taller, I had more energy, even though I would have to sleep because you know we're on a 24 hour cycle and their one day is equivalent to almost 31 days of our world. That's their one day. And many of the Andromedans were concerned that I wasn't well because I had to keep taking naps. Okay, well, you know, I can only stay awake for 15 hours at a time. So, you know, there are changes. There were some real subtle changes of things that you'd have to deal with. Um, they would have to get some food from Earth to have for me, including water, because I couldn't eat their fruit because it had too much oxygen in it. Um, and, and, the, and the same for the water, okay? Um, one time they came to pick me up and they had the little green tablets. And this is what they use when they're away from the motherships. This is their, their food source. And it contains all the nutrition of their meals. And I mean, they're no bigger than this. And I asked to try it. There was, um, some telepathic communication between the crew. Some of them didn't think it was a good idea at all, but I was able to persuade Morinay to let me try it, of which he did, but he just broke off a little piece, just a little piece for me. So I took it and I chewed it up, and it tasted like hay or alfalfa here in our world. And I immediately felt full, okay? I felt full. I'm like, wow, oh, this is great. You know, this is great. And no more than just a few more minutes went by, and suddenly I'm getting pretty sick. I'm like, oh my God. Okay, and I had eaten earlier in the day on Earth, and I started to throw up. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you, but I made a mess, okay, of this room we were in. And Mornay was more than gracious. He just took me by the elbow and said, come on, let's go. And somebody else cleaned it up. And then he told me that the reason I got sick is because their food has too much oxygen for our body in it. Okay? Um, and that's something, as far as our ecosystem, that they watch very carefully is the depletion of our oxygen levels in our atmosphere. So... Um, on the motherships, they have these huge parks. Uh, there's all kinds of animal life and plant life. Because they're fifth dimension or fifth density, they have colors there and, and, and animal life and plant life that I cannot describe for you 
because we just simply don't have any equal or, or anything that I could um, use as a reference point, okay? Um, but nonetheless, they're incredibly beautiful. And you don't use vehicles inside the park, all right? They have train systems or, or tram systems that don't make a sound. They don't have engines. Um, I'm assuming they use some type of form of magnetics. Um, and what you do is if you need to go from one place to the other in the ship, you can either get in and go up along the, the sides because along the outside of these parks, uh, these park areas, is like this. And if you look at every one of these areas here, and we can use this room as, an, as a perfect example, this would be a series of apartments all the way across. This would be a series of apartments with balconies, and everybody lives next to these parks, or on the outskirts of these parks. This is where all the living quarters are. And this is on each floor. I mean, one floor, literally, you could probably take the entire city of Tokyo and put it inside one of these little parks. That's how big it is. And what's even more amazing is that when you're down on the bottom and you're enjoying the park, you know, you're seeing sunlight, sun day, morning, day, dusk, nighttime, and the whole cycle continues again. All right? And it, you can easily forget that you're not on a planet, that you're on a spaceship moving through space. It's awesome, folks. It is just so awesome. <laughs> You know, I, it's just, you just, you just forget, you know, and it's so easy to forget and because everybody's so busy and everybody is, is helping and everybody's just contributing and there's no judgment and everyone has absolute mutual respect for each other and because you don't have any stress and nobody's judging you or, or anything like that. Um, it's an awesome world. It's an awesome world. And there have been a lot of times, there have been a lot of times I didn't want to come back. And they literally forced me to come back. One time in particular, um, I was forced to come back. I didn't want to come back. Nothing was working here for me. You know, and I'm already in another reality. Um, I was forced to come back. They literally forced me to come back. And as I'm standing on the ground, I'm crying, and I'm looking up, and, and the, the craft is leaving, and, and uh, Phaseus is standing there at the doorway, and he turns and he looks at me, and he telepathically says, Alex, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry, lifetime after lifetime. <coughs> I apologize again. Okay? I want to share that with you. The love that you withhold is the pain that you carry lifetime after lifetime. Now, that was an enormous revelation for me because I was still dealing with my Catholic upbringing. Okay? There is no heaven and hell. It just simply doesn't exist. It's, it's a myth, a story. And are you judged? From what they say, no. What, you, what happens is you cross over and you are shown places in your life where you chose to withhold love. And those are the choices. Those are the reasons you come back is so that you can make different choices to not withhold love. Because love is what is. There is a God or something. The Andromedans don't know exactly what it is, but there is a force. Okay? They refer to it as isness. It just is. Okay? And it holds all of the dimensions and galaxies and universes together. It's intelligent. Um, when we got to, to the discussions of God, I always used the masculine um, because of my upbringing. Um, at one point, Phaseus corrected me and said, well, if you had to give it a gender, it would actually be feminine. Okay, so hold grasp of that. Okay. Again, it's a shift in what we've been taught. 
Um, let's see. It's our destiny to travel out into space. It's our destiny to converse, to establish and create trade with other ET races. Um, I just don't have an exact year of when that's all going to happen. Okay, but it, it's our destiny. And part of that destiny is being able to manage and control and live with ourselves. Um, we all have a soul, okay? So we are spiritual beings. There is a creator, createss, okay? Um, what I want to do at this moment is I once asked, I once asked Phaseus what was going to become of us. And what was going to happen to our races? Who are we going to become? Um, because they were giving me this terrible, or not, not terrible, let me take that back. They were giving me this reflection of who we are. They don't understand how we could be genetic royalty and allow people to starve. They don't understand why we would war with each other and build technology for the sole purpose of destruction thinking that it was all that it was going to keep us safe and from harm when we don't build anything that we don't use um, they don't understand they just don't understand why we don't get it um, I guess they feel that we should know better There was a time, um, there has been times, where there have been many discussions amongst ET groups about what to do on Earth to help us. There's been discussions regarding intervention around 2012. There have been discussions about intervention previous to 2012 um, regarding things that and the most of us don't know anything about in our world. Um, in those conversations, um, which are very open conversations, um, there were several groups of, or civilizations of extraterrestrial groups who didn't want to help Earth and basically said, well, just, you know, let's just see what they do. Let's not intervene in any way, shape, or form. And here were their reasons, and, I, and I, I think it's important for you to know. The reasons that this group did not want to help or intervene in any way with us is because of three things. They don't respect their home. They don't respect themselves. They don't respect each other. What is their value? Okay, now they weren't talking about just Americans, they weren't talking about Japanese, they weren't talking just about Russians or Chinese, they were talking about all of us and all the decisions that we make every single day as a, as a race, you know? And uh, that one hurt, that one still hurts. And those of us in the United States have been trying to get the word out, we've had, um, a lot of problems trying to get this out. People who are closed-minded, news media that thinks it's ridiculous, uh, religious fanatics who simply will not let go of old dogma that should have been dead 400 years ago. It, it's, it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. And the bottom line is you can't make anybody do anything because we all have free will. So part of those things were my frustration um, because 
you know, when I was eight, I had no idea that in my adult life that I would be speaking. Um, and if I had read the fine print on my contract, I probably wouldn't have done it. So what I've done, what I, ha I did was I asked, say, at, at, at a moment of just pure, you know, letting go, what's going to happen to us? Here's his answer. This is what he said when I said what was going to be to become of us as a race. This is Phaseus. Responsible freedom of self-determination. Becoming truly self-confident and free. To unconditionally be responsible for oneself without being coerced to accept some higher authority. I can only hope you got all that. Okay? It's all about self-responsibility. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are all ancient. We are all ancient. Forget the physicality, just the soul. We are ancient. We come from a place that is so far outside of time and pain, if we could only remember for a moment what that is, it would probably go a long way in freeing ourselves from the drama that is Earth. And that's what it is. It's a drama. It's like a soap opera. Okay? Um, Many of our indigenous cultures had a lot more wisdom than we do today. And they still have more wisdom than we do today. Um, in our country, we have the Native Americans. Um, every country has their own indigenous cultures. Um, not only were they spiritually evolved, but they had incredible ways of healing using earth sciences. Many of those are only now making a comeback, okay? Using herbs, um, essential oils, uh, color, light, sound, uh, hands-on energy, healing, uh, prayer, all those things. Um, it's imperative that we pay attention to that wisdom because our civilizations, the way they are based on profit, based on control, based on manipulation, um, are not going to be around much longer, okay? They simply cannot sustain themselves because they're lies. They're built on a lie. And many people on, on earth are beginning to withdraw from those dramas. They're beginning to take some responsibility. They're taking, looking into their own healing. Um, they're doing more and more uh, on a nutritional level to take care of their bodies instead of going to see their doctor. This is all a good path. It is the right path for all of us. It is not to say in an emergency you don't use the medical society but not for everything, okay? It is always, it's our responsibility because you create yourself, okay? You are literally creating yourself. I'm not, you are. In fact, the Andromedans, when they talk about the isness, one of the things that they say is that the worship of the isness is the creation of self. That in worshiping and praying to God, you are actually creating yourself. Because all God does, whatever that essence or presence is, is mirror back to you who you think you are. It just takes a decision to change. 
and then the courage to follow through and act and change, to do something different in the world. And this is why we're so excited about being here in Japan to talk to you guys about this. Um, because you're strong, you're wise, you're very determined, and you know about peace better than anybody. Okay? After experiencing what you did at the end of World War II, you're strong. You know, you came back. And uh, that's leadership. And the world needs your kind of leadership, both on an individual level, community level, as well as a national level. Okay? I'm an American, so I can say this. We have many, many problems in America right now. And we're worried. <laughs> we're very worried. Um, I want to share with you, um, in their own words, um, some of the things that they've, they've talked about. Now, there's a lot of talk about a shifting of dimensions, uh, changing of frequencies. Yes, this is, in fact, happening. Okay, it isn't just about consciousness, although actually it is about consciousness because when consciousness shifts, physicality responds and changes. So it starts inside of us. Okay? Now, according to the Andromedans, on March 23rd of 1993, a color sound frequency started emanating from all the black holes in our known galaxies or universe. It's the first time it's ever happened and they just simply didn't know what it was about. What they have learned since then is that this frequency which involves color, light, and sound is so high that it is literally changing the dimensions all the way up to what they say we have 11 dimensions in our known um, holograph, which we call a universe. Okay, it's a holograph. It's, it's a, a self-contained picture of all the dimensions that this frequency is literally changing the entire holograph, dimensional holograph of our universe. Not only are we going through changes, but so are the Andromedans and all the other races that are involved. Okay? They have heard and again, this is third, maybe fourth-hand information. They have heard that those on 11th density that have shared their experience which what is with, with what is happening to lower densities and then the communication is, is working its way down is that this new 12th density has colors that have never been seen before, harmonics that have never been seen before, and also conscious beings that no one has ever seen before. And that these conscious beings have the ability to look straight down through all the dimensions. So, change is happening. Okay? So I told you that so, so I could set this up. This is from Morinay. All of us, regardless of our form, and dimensional growth live in boundless consciousness. It does appear that all things revolve and evolve in cycles. Now, after the blindness of 5,725 years, you on your terra, earth, are about to regain yourselves. It will be such an unprecedented change that it will be many, it will be difficult for many to grasp 
your own potential. It is a turning point on your world which none of your planet's forefathers were privileged to experience. Okay, so we're the first. We're the first. I know that there's a lot of books. I know that there's a lot of channels. I know that there will probably be many contactees who share their knowledge. Our future has not been written yet. We're creating it every day in every way. I know that there's a lot of talk of complete destruction. It doesn't have to happen. And it may not happen. Okay, the question is, what do you want? You know? You create yourself. In creating yourself, you create your community. In creating the community, you create your nation. And in creating the nation, you help create the race. Okay? The question is, what do you want? I had an opportunity to ask um, recently, what's the one question that I should, I should tell people? Is, is there a question? that I should say to them? Is there something that I should ask them? Is there something that I should tell them, you know, that's simple but clear and direct? And the response from Moronet was simple. So here's his question to you. The question for our humanity is, how do we make love stay? That's the question. How do you make love stay? How do you make it stay inside of you? How do you make yourself continuously remember to love and honor yourself and not care about what somebody else thinks because it really doesn't matter, you know? That's the question. How do we make love stay? Um, I pulled this out. I've never read this before. This was from Phaseus in 1997. Um, this was a, another contact, and um, I was having a hard time taking, living in this reality where I would visit them and then have to come back to Earth. Um, cost a lot of pain for me. And um, these were some notes that I jotted down during a conversation or teaching that he had for me. And this is for all of us. Develop love and reason. Cultivate real freedom through the awareness of truth. Create focused intent in a divine direction. Self-knowledge has always meant a surpassing of limitations and a coming to maturity. Mankind makes itself. And we are also our own historians. We also are the directors of our future. And we have to take responsibility for the future. 
because we are our own inheritance. Um, there are hundreds of ET civilizations visiting Earth, and they will continue to visit Earth or pass by Earth on their, on their way to other galaxies. There are some specific races um, that actually have a genetic lineage to the peoples of Earth, and they are actively pursuing um, ways to help us and empower us and not violate our free will. Now, there are a lot of people who I've met over the years who have said, well, geez, Alex, you know, why don't they just intervene? Why don't they just take the bad guys and put them on an asteroid and send them into space? I, I personally like that idea, actually. Okay. However, <laughs> um, if they do the work for us, what will we have learned? Now, irregardless of the fact that we desperately all want change and we want to see things work better, it's, it's our responsibility to at least begin the effort to make the change. And we're kind of at a disadvantage, royalty or not, because throughout our galaxy alone, are, is history of intervention that did not empower those particular planetary races to, self, to accept self-responsibility and make permanent change. And those societies no longer exist. All of the ETs that visit Earth that may or may not intervene have to have a genetic lineage to our people. Otherwise, they can't be here. They're not supposed to be here. Okay? In the years to come, you will hear and be taught that ETs created us, that we are their children. I want to remind you that your soul, first and foremost, the shell, is just something we use so that we can move through and experience third density, and fourth density, and fifth density, okay? When I look at what our potential future is, and I look in this room, and I see how many of you have come to at least hear what this is about, I am very proud, and I am very, very honored that you would take the time to be here. Tomo arigato.
ありがとうございました。素晴らしいお話をしていただきました。えー、ウィンディアル、アレックスコーリアさんに今一度、大きな拍手でお送りいただきたいと思います。<笑>ありがとうございました。アレックスコーリアさんでした。よろしくお願いいたします。ありがとうございました。ではただいまより少しお時間をいただきまして、この講演にあたりまして、ご協力いただきましたスタッフの方を少しご紹介させていただきたいと思います。まず、この素晴らしい講演の講師の方々の通訳をして、同時通訳をしていただいております、インターグループの方々でございます。お名前を申し上げます。梅香代さん、重松美穂さん、友田淳二さん。この方が3名、えー、同時通訳で、えー、協力していただいております、えー、それと、あのー、大阪、札幌、えー、幕張と3カ所でございますが、えー、この同時通訳をはじめ、えー、マイク関係、音響関係をすべてやっていただいております、IVS さんでございます、ご協力いただいております、拍手でお願いいたします、ありがとうございました。えー、これをもちまして本日は、えー閉会とさせていただきます、えー、長い間ご聴講いただきましてありがとうございました明日も午前10時から、えー、2日目の公演となります会場も同じく、えー、ここ、えー、ホテルスプリングス幕張、えー、スプリングスホール地下1階でございます、えー、お間違いのないようにこちらのホールにお越しくださいますようによろしくお願い申し上げますお時間も10時からとなっておりますのでよろしくお願いいたします本日は、えー、長い間ありがとうございましたどうぞお気をつけてお帰りくださいませ心から感謝いたしますありがとうございましたえー、それと、えー、お帰りになりますときに、えー、受付の方でですねあのこのレシーバーとそれとですねこの、えー、パスポートを一つにしていただきましてあの受付の方の方にお返しいただきますようよろしくお願いいたします。えまた明日これあの受付の方でまた改めてあのお渡しいたしますことになっておりますのでお忘れになりませんようにパスポートとレシーバーをお預けくださいませ。ではまず明日お待ちしておりますのでよろしくお願いいたします。ありがとうございました。お気をつけてお帰りください。はい、え今日はどうもありがとうございました。素晴らしいお話を。たくさんの方にお伝えくださいませまた明日お友達をお誘いの上ぜひあのこれから2012年の12月22日ですねあのどんなふうな光で降りてくるのかというお話をあのしてくださいますのでぜひぜひまた楽しみにして明日いらしてくださいお帰りを気をつけてエネルギーだいぶ良くなりましたありがとうございました感謝でございます皆様のおかげです嬉しいですありがとうございました